children are going to be dismissed. If you can continue to stand, we're going to read the scripture together. We're going to kids' church, get to head where they're going. We're going to remain standing and read together, working our way through the Ten Commandments. We come to commandment number eight this morning, and we're going to read together, beginning in Exodus chapter 20. The Word of God says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the heaven, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery. And let's read this last part together. You shall not steal. You can be seated. It's been good to work our way through the Ten Commandments. And friends, there comes a, a temptation as we get toward the end to sort of to, sort of to shut our brains off. You're like, Pastor, I get it. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. We know this. How are you going to fill a whole sermon on something like this? Yet, these commandments are meant to challenge us, regardless of who we are or where we find ourselves. In fact, God intended for the Ten Commandments to serve for all of life in the people of Israel. And in fact, even in the New Covenant, the Ten Commandments show us something about God's priority for our life. And as we come to Commandment 8, so as we're sort of winding down on our walk through, through these commandments, I want us to see that God is really taking us full circle. In fact, let me show you something here on the first slide. I, I want to explain this to you because I think this is interesting. Up here, that's kind of cut off toward the top. The, command, the first commandment really serves as a foundation, right? You shall have no other gods before me. And then look at how it sort of forms a circle, almost. Commandment two, no idols. Commandment three, don't take his name in vain. Commandment four is the Sabbath command regarding work and rest. Commandment number five, honor your father and mother, which is sort of a command about family, right? And you get commandment six on murder, and then it starts back over. Commandment seven, adultery, a commandment about the family. Commandment eight, stealing. That's really a commandment about work, as we're going to see. Commandment nine, don't speak in vain, don't lie. And then it closes out with don't covet. And last week, Russ, our guest speaker who was here, actually preached on Colossians chapter 3, which tells us there in verse 5 that covetousness is idolatry. You see the big circle here that God is taking us on as we work through the Ten Commandments. And as we come to commandment 8, we see that the command not to steal is not simply about not taking something that belongs to somebody else. That's certainly part of it, but there's so much more to it than that. The Eighth Commandment is really a command of provision, a commandment to be self-sufficient. And ultimately, the Eighth Commandment teaches us four things, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. Four things that the Eighth Commandment teaches us, and first, the Eighth Commandment teaches us to, first, respect property. <coughs> to respect property. Friends, some people will tell you that the idea of private property or property ownership is really a very novel idea, that it's about as old as America is. There'll be folks who have 
certain political leanings and socialist ideologies that will try to erase property and personal belongings <coughs> altogether. But let me tell you something, friends. Private property goes all the way back to the Old Testament. And while we're to respect and value property, it's important that we realize something. And this is what we see in our first sort of point underneath that. Is we need to see something that God makes a clear distinction between the value of property and the value of people. Both have value, but friends, they're not equally important. Notice, even as we go through the, the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment had, had distinctions between servants, who in these days were sort of like employees, and livestock. That the servants, or the slaves, as your translation may say, were not, again, slaves as we think of today, because the Eighth Commandment actually forbids the practice of buying and selling people as we're going to see, but the, and, and that God's word would clearly condemn things that happened in the past in, in the South in America, that the Bible would have known nothing of what occurred in the, in the 1800s, the African slave trade. In fact, again, the Bible would tell us that we're to honor and value people <laughs> above property, even though both are important. Let me show you this. Exodus chapter 21, right on the heels of Exodus 20, says this. Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. Pretty serious, right? That's what would occur to you in Israel if you were caught stealing a person. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul offers a list of sins that the law exposes, and among those was the sin of enslavement. God intends for us to own things and not people. That's one of the things the Eighth Commandment's here to remind us about. And even in the Tenth Commandment on coveting, notice that it talks about coveting your neighbor's stuff and then separates out coveting your neighbor's wife. It makes an important distinction, fellas, between your stuff and your wife. <laughs> right? And in other words, the principle is that people always matter more than property. And I think we intrinsically know this. When someone's lost everything in a house fire, but the family got out, we typically go, well, you can replace what was in the house, right? But you can't replace the people that are within the house. And did you notice that the punishment when we looked at the seventh commandment on murder or even the commandment on stealing people was the death penalty. And yet as we come to the destruction of property, we'll see that it is not the, a, a punishment of death, but of restitution. To pay back, usually plus some, what we stole to give back plus additional damages. Let me give you some examples you can look at. You can mark down and read this later today, but... Exodus chapter 21, verse 34, 33 and 34, says that if a man leaves a hole open and his neighbor's ox falls into the hole and dies, he needs to get his neighbor a new ox because he built his hole in a place that it should not have been. While this was accidental, there was a replacement of property that was needed. There was restitution to be made. And even Exodus 21, verse 1, look at this. This is an intentional act of theft. And it's as if a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. You see the standard here? And notice it makes a distinction between accidents that happen and somebody intentionally taking someone else's property. But he says, hey, if you steal steal it, you owe four to five times more in return. In these days, friends, oxes were incredibly valuable. That was currency in that day, was to have livestock. Friends, it would have provided meat, and it could have been mated with others in order to make their investment grow even more. And so, friends, whenever somebody was to steal these ox from them, it's not like they could just give them a new baby ox. But that ox would need time to grow up in order to be at the point where the ox they stole was. And so restitution was required in order to cover for the loss of the ox and any future loss that might result from the theft. This was
was even the standard in Jesus' day when Zacchaeus, the wee little man, as we call him, right? Look what he says to the Lord. This is Luke 19, 8. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Do you see, the Eighth Commandment teaches us to respect property and to pay restitution when it is stolen or destroyed. Because, friends, hear this. When we steal other people's goods, people are hurt. The stealing and destruction of property, while not the same as taking human life, does impact human life. Theft trickles down and affects everybody involved. You may feel justified in your mind thinking, well, I steal from one of these big companies. That, that's not going to impact them. Think of how much money those people make. And yet, friends, when you steal, that theft hurts others because when you take it, the cost has to be made up somewhere. And typically, it's either made up by the consumers or by the workers. Friends, theft hurts other people. The taking of private property impacts beyond the one taken from and the one doing the taking. In fact, the, the law of Moses echoes this as well. Here's one of these interesting laws in the book of Deuteronomy. I think it's really interesting. <coughs> Look at this. Deuteronomy 19.14. You shall not move your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old had set, in the inheritance that you will hold in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. In other words, he's saying, hey, people of God, recognize property lines. He said, don't scoop the fence just a few feet onto the other person's property in order to sort of extend your own a little bit. In fact, Deuteronomy echoes later. Look at this, 27.17. I love this. Cursed be anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. He said, don't move the fence. Don't take other people's property. God is concerned with property we use for our own good, such as ox and cattle, and he's concerned with the property we live and we own, such as our property line. And the Eighth Commandment teaches us to respect other people's property. If I can put it in the way that I would put to a five-year-old, keep your hands off of other people's stuff. That's what God's teaching us, and we all need this sort of reminder. We also need to be reminded, friends, that we can steal in other ways, can't we? Leviticus 19.11 says this, You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another. You can steal when you deal falsely, when you scam someone by presenting something in a way that isn't true. Have you ever received one of those emails from a Nigerian prince needing your help to get his inheritance? Right? Anybody remember those back in the day? Have you ever gotten a, a Facebook message from somebody pretending to be your friend or who's created a clone account or hacked an account, right, and they sent you something, and somehow they just really need you to send them money? <clears throat> Friends, fraud, along with breaking the ninth commandment about lying, is also stealing. It's breaking the eighth commandment. And the Eighth Commandment also would forbid us from loaning money at an excess interest. The law of Moses speaks that there's only certain situations in which in the land of Israel they were to have interest on loans that they were having people borrow. And it really only needed to happen in certain situations and never with a desire for profit or gain. Let me show you this. Leviticus 25. If your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him your food for profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and be your God. Now, don't try calling your mortgage company this afternoon and reading them this verse, because that's not going to get you very far, right? And the principle for us is a little more distant in that it's telling us don't take advantage of someone in a bind. 
You all can know somebody's in a bind and go, you know, I could probably sweeten this deal for me a little bit. But when we do that, friends, we're stealing. We're not respecting them as a person, nor respecting their property. Don't exploit the poor and the needy. Friends, if you own a business or you hire a contract to pay people on time with the agreed upon rates, seek to care about and seek to protect others who are being scammed and cheated because, friends, often the poor and the vulnerable are the most impacted. The Eighth Commandment teaches us to respect property. Here's the second thing. The Eighth Commandment teaches us to work hard. The Eighth Commandment teaches us to work hard. Notice again in that circle I put up earlier of the Ten Commandments that the Fourth and the Eighth Commandment are related to each other on both sides of the circle. And the Sabbath is often thought of as a command primarily about rest. Or really, it's also a command about work, isn't it? So they rest one day, but work six. Look at this, uh, Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. It teaches us this rhythm of one day of rest, but also a rhythm of six days of work. And the eighth commandment regarding stealing is an invitation to work for what you had. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul describes repentance and new life in Christ, and he sort of gives these instructions. And he says, hey, to those who were in the Ephesian congregation, who were former thieves, here's what he says, Ephesians 4, 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. He says that let them no longer steal, let them work honest work with their hands. He says, hey, not something where they can manipulate or twist others or ultimately be reliant on others. Friends, one of God's answers to theft is work. Only people without jobs typically have time to rob banks. And friends, have you ever noticed that you hear some of these complicated scams people are doing, and you're like, couldn't you just done less work and went to the McDonald's? Like, it's so complicated, and they spent all this time and effort. They could have just got a job. But I believe this applies to more than just bank robbers. I think this applies right to us. What about when we're stealing from our employees by using the time we should be on the clock to just scroll through Facebook? They're paying us for that time, but we're doing what we want with it. Or has anyone ever taken an unapproved extended lunch break or maybe milk those bathroom breaks just a little much, all on the boss's dime. Friends, we steal when we do that. And God calls us to work and to work hard. In fact, Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, and friends, Thessalonica, that, that church had a problem. Every person in the church had quit their job. Imagine that. It was the first church of unemployment that was there at Thessalonica. And the reason they did it was they believed the Lord's coming was so soon, they all went up and just quit their jobs. And they were in for a rude awakening down the road. And Paul actually writes to them and he says this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he says this, Now we commend you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition which you received from us. In other words, he tells us, hey, idleness is contagious within the body. So they, be careful because if they start sitting on the couch and then you get on the comfy couch with them, you might just end up on the unemployment line along with them, right? And he rebukes them and he calls them to consider his own example. Here's verse 7 and 8. He says this, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Paul says this, he says, hey, I'm an apostle, I could have, whenever I was over at your house, asked to have a little extra bread and not pay you for it. I think if the apostle Paul showed up in any of our houses, we'd kind of go, hey, here, have what you want. And Paul says, I could have done that, 
but I didn't. He said, in fact, I was willing to work hard. In fact, Paul actually worked another job often while he did his apostolic ministry. Though he had a right to ask them for it, he says in verse 9, he says he chose to do bivocational ministry. Acts chapter 18 gives a glimpse of this. You can go read that later. And it tells us Paul, while doing his apostolic ministry, was also a tent maker. Pretty regular job that he was able to do there. He worked with his hands so that he could serve with his apostolic voice without hindrance. And he says, follow my example. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such people we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. Notice, Paul shows us how jobs keep you from descending into various sins. He said, frankly, a day job is a good thing because it keeps you from doing other stuff that you might want to go do. In fact, he warns us about this, that idleness leads to idolatrous actions. Friends, you ever just had to sit around the house and then you really start getting into some you know, just started getting into more and more and more trouble. He says, friends, he warns us that, hey, those who weren't busy at work in the Thessalonian church became busy bodies, being concerned about everybody else's business. And he says, hey, that's a sin. Being concerned about everybody else's business is a sin, and it's actually one of the first steps towards stealing. If you're too busy working that you don't know what your neighbor has, you'll never be tempted to steal it because you don't know they got it. If you're busy at work, you won't have time to want. And Paul says, focus on your work. Do your work faithfully. Earn a, a faithful, quiet living. Doing your own work. Stay in your lane. This is what pleases God. And Paul was telling us, follow his example, but he was just following the example of another. Friends, the Son of God had a day job. He was a carpenter, wasn't he, before giving himself over into full-time ministry. Friends, the Son of God didn't come on the scene and go, well, I don't need a job at 15, Mom. <laughs> I'm the ruler and reigner over all things, right? No, he was a carpenter, and his disciples were fishermen, and they often used their skills of fishermen, of fishing to support the ministry. Here's the point. God calls <clears throat> us to work. Hard. And I want to say this, work doesn't have to simply mean a 9 to 5 or your main vocation. It can, for many of us it does, but friends, let me tell you something, moms, y'all work a lot. Whether stay at home or work, however that looks for you, y'all work hard. Some of y'all are retired, and that's great. You worked hard earlier in life to save so that you wouldn't have to work vocationally, but so that you could work in other areas as grandparents as volunteers, as spouses, as church members, whatever it is. But ultimately, what the Eighth Commandment tells us to do is to stay busy, to not just sit around in idleness and to work unto the Lord. Because if you just sit around all day, theft becomes a temptation. Man, I wish I had that nice car. Man, I wish I had what the, the nice house that they have. Little, little do you know when you work, when you get inside, the whole thing's destroyed in a mess and fallen in, and they're, and they're, neat, they're neck deep in renovations, right? And actually, this leads us to our third point, that the Eighth Commandment teaches us to be content. Friends, value, respect property, work hard, and be content, because theft begins with a desire for something that you do not have. In one sense, coveting is really the root of all theft. And the battle against covetousness is the battle for contentment. And in every situation, we can be content. Paul warns us, 1 Timothy chapter 6, I love this. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Notice that. 
right? A godly life and being content with what you have. You want to live a life of great gain? There's the equation for you. Godliness with contentment. And then he says, for we brought nothing into this world, and we're going to take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But for those who desire to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I want you to be careful to notice the warning that leads to destruction. He doesn't say money is the root of all evil. You hear people say that all the time, and usually those people that have a lot of it, or that want a lot of it, say, well, it's really evil, why don't you have some, you know, give me some, right? <laughs> Spread the love a little bit, right? But no, he's saying that the love of money is the root of all evil. The problem isn't having stuff, it's when stuff has you. Right? And contentment comes by recognizing that we have what we need rather than what we want. It's that basic lesson you get, maybe elementary school, middle school, the sort of basic wants and needs, right? Friends, I need food in the fridge. Bills pay so that I can have lights and air and heat and a structure to live in. You do not need, what, what are we now on, a PlayStation 10, however many we're at now? We don't need that, right? But we, but we need to have a place to stay because it's cold outside. <laughs> and we got to understand and be content that, friends, if we're at the end of the month and we're alive and we've got food, friends, we should thank the Lord those things. And contentment comes by recognizing we have a hope that cannot be taken away. I want you to see what the Apostle Peter says in the opening of his letter. I love this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. See this, friends. Your money, your 401ks, maybe if you desire fame and influence, friends, that's going to perish, be defiled, and fade away one day. If all your hope's in the stock market, you might have some rough days. If it's found in the approval of others, it's going to shift tomorrow. If, friends, your ultimate hope is rooted in this world, it's going to go away when you do. But the Christian hope is in heaven. And Christ helps us in the present to do what he calls us to do. Here's the point. Our future hope, rooted in Jesus' past work, brings present contentment. If you have a, this hope in the future that is yours because of what Jesus has done for you, then you're able to have present contentment. Remember, we know that we know the famous verse, Philippians 4.13, right? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's one of the most popular verses people take out of context. Because did you know that verse isn't a self-affirmation that you can do anything you put your mind to? Friends, I don't care how much I think I'm a bird. If I strap some wings on me and jump off this building, I'm not flying. And if I do, I certainly am not going to know what I'm going to do when I start flying. Like, right? Friends, no, 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 no. Because Paul tells us that we will often blow it. And that we can't do anything we simply set our minds to. Rather, Philippians 4.13 is telling us that we're able to endure and be content regardless of our circumstances, because of the strength that Jesus provides. Let me show you the context around Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I learned that in whatever situation I am in, to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And notice Paul says there's nothing wrong with being low or abounding. And all in any situation, I learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. There is strength in Christ, and we can be content. And friends, we often think that money and things are going to make us more content. 
But did you notice, Paul said we need that strength even when we have abundance and a ton of stuff. Did you know that rich people are often some of the most miserable people you ever meet? There's a reason the song says more money, more problems, not more money, less problems. Friends, money's not a bad thing, but if you have all your hope in it, friends, you're playing a fool's game. If you want a great example of this, go home, plan to read this week the book of Ecclesiastes. This is Solomon. I, I like to call him Grumpy Solomon. At the end of his life, looking back on the fact that he had more money than any of us have ever had, more women than anybody here has ever had, now he had like a hundred wives at the same time. I uh, know, right? Wow. <laughs> and then the guy, and he had palaces, he had real estate, he had all this stuff. And then he looks back and he goes, it was all in vain. And I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody else here that if we are not content with what we have, we will never be content with more. And that is what the Eighth Commandment is telling us. Because thieves are never content. They just want to take and take and take and consume and consume and consume, never having their fill. And the way that we break the Eighth Commandment is trying to find contentment in something other than the imperishable, undefiled, and unfading hope of Jesus. That's how we begin to break the Eighth Commandment. And friends, it's out of that incredible hope that Jesus gives us that we can see the last point of how we fight breaking the Eighth Commandment, what the Eighth Commandment teaches us. We need to flee the temptation to steal by seeking to hoard, be generous. That's one of the things the Eighth Commandment teaches us, is be generous. Because friends, did you know this? Everything you own is actually God's first before it's yours. And he, he's letting you borrow it for a little while. <laughs> and he's wanting you to be a good steward with it. And some of that involves being generous with what we have. I love this imagery from the book of Leviticus. This is one of my favorite things. Leviticus 23, 22. This might be the only verse you can ever highlight in the book of Leviticus, but I want you to. <laughs> and when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right to its edges, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. In other words, he wanted Israel, God wanted Israelite farmers to consider wanderers when they harvested their crops. He said, you might have people that wander through your land and they might take a handful of grapes or a handful of, of, of whatever you're growing and eat a little bit. And he wanted, to, he wanted them to be mindful, not to take advantage of them, but actually to encourage the farmers in their reaping to leave a small portion to serve others. Don't harvest all the way to the end. In other words, don't live exactly to the end of your means. Leave some room to be generous. And I want you to imagine how leaving the end of the field might serve not just as a not just as a means of serving the poor, but as a reminder, oh, I'm supposed to care for the poor. To remember, oh, I've got a widow down the street. Maybe I should bring some of this to her. Giving serves both as a way to care for the needy, but also as a reminder of all that God has given us. In other words, if you want to fight greed, give. Because that's the difficulty. When it comes to because greed will well up in you and go, I can hang on to this. I'm sure I'm going to use it. And sure, you probably will use it. But it might not be for something all that important that will make it all that big of an impact in somebody else's life. Maybe your neighbor needs it more than you do. And let me tell you something. The Bible says that God loves giving. In fact, God's word says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully, and each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Those two things are big, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound in you, so that in all sufficiency and all things at all times you may abound in every good work. Notice God isn't pleased with people that give just out of reluctance 
or I'm gonna put a, or they have a big grin on their, or they have a big like, crap, you know, sad face on when they do it. He says, no, God loves a cheerful giver. And he says, decide in your heart, don't do it under reluctancy, under compulsion, or because you're like, oh, somebody's watching me right now. That's a terrible reason to do it. God isn't pleased with that. He'd rather you keep it in your wallet than give it to him for any other reason than to serve others and out of love for him. And the promise is that God's able to make all grace abound in you so that you'll have everything you need to do every good work that will come in front of you. And I cling to that promise sometimes. And here's this point. The way we fight against the desire for ungodly gain is by generously giving what we got the right way. You want to know something? If you have a desire to gain something in an ungodly way, it's to say generously give away what you got the right way, and it'll show you, one, the value of hard work, and it'll show you that God's given you this, because, friends, thieves are never generous. And for those who have received much grace, we're called to be gracious with our giving. So let me ask you this. How are you giving? I'm going to First, say, friends, we've got tons of great need in this community. There's tons of individuals that we probably live around who are struggling in a way that we may never know. We've got tons of great nonprofits in our community. I'm gonna, the Way is an incredible ministry doing incredible work. We've got you know, ministries like Helping Hands that are doing incredible things. Let me even tell you, maybe the best way to think about Giving is to understand that when we give to a local yeah. church like this, you're giving through the church to impact work in Peru, Haiti, our food basket ministry, serving kids and families through all of these ways that we do it. The encouragement is to be intentional, to gladly give for the good of others and for the glory of God. And so in closing, I want you to consider the two most famous thieves in the Bible. In my opinion, they're the two most famous thieves in the Bible, and each of them represent a different way to respond to today's message. First, I want to introduce you to a man you probably know. His name was Judas, right? And Judas is remembered for a lot of things, but the one thing that probably scares me the most whenever I think about the life of Judas is how good of a front he put on. He showed up on Sunday, friends, he had a perfect attendance record. He was everywhere Jesus was. Had a star for his seat. He knew exactly where he was going. Friends, he could put on the Sunday morning church performance, yet below the surface, his heart was far from God. And we learn a lot about him in John chapter 12. And in the context of this, a woman has just come up to Jesus, poured this expensive ointment all over his feet, and she is worshiping him. And giving him all sorts of praise and glory. And Judas and the disciples see this. And look what he says. Judas says this. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was going to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Let me say, 300 denarii is a lot of money. And so notice Judas acts like he's concerned for the poor even while he's about to crucify Jesus. And believe me, Jesus didn't have a lot of money, right? There are many acts of philanthropy that we need to understand are really phony covers for people benefiting themselves. There's a principle here. But notice, we see that Judas had other motives behind this question. Verse 6, Judas said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Before Jesus ever before Judas ever betrayed Jesus for a few coins, Judas was a thief. Stealing from the Son of God and his ministry from the start. And he covered it with a great show. And friends, I fear many of us may present great, but in our heart, we are like Judas. We can give this great cover of, well, you know, we could have helped the poor with that. And by poor, he meant poor Judas, right? By poor, he meant himself. 
nobody else. And Judas desired more things because things had become all he desired. Would we say that's true for us? And when we respond to God's word today by hardening our hearts, consider Judas was around Jesus' teaching the whole time. And yet he even heard Jesus say things like, Blessed are the poor in spirit, love your neighbor, and he still was just dip it in the, dip it in the money bag, right? He was willing to sell Jesus out for even a couple little coins in order to have lunch. And when we exchange Jesus for the things of this world, we do the same thing. Selling him out for even the tiniest pleasure purchased with silver and gold. But let me tell you, there is hope in another famous thief in the Bible. In fact, we don't even know his name. But the, Jesus, but the Bible says when Jesus was crucified, there were two thieves on each side of him, right? One thief, like Judas, mocked Jesus, rejected him as they were crucified together, and that man missed out on all sorts of blessings and got a just punishment and a just um, injustice for what he did. But oh, the other thief. He's the one we remember, and he's the one who experienced the wondrous forgiveness of Jesus. I want you to just see a couple words we get from this unnamed thief. This is Luke chapter 23. Look at this. And we indeed justly. In other words, we indeed are, are justly suffering, for we're receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. The thief recognizes what he did. He repents and he says, hey, I know this Jesus is sinless. And then he places his faith in him. In verse 42, and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The thief knew he couldn't make it on his own merits. He knew that, that Jesus was dying and Jesus had lived a perfect life and that Jesus was dying in his place. And he says, hey, let me. Please remember me. He knew he needed sovereign love and mercy from the God-man. And he places his full faith and trust. He can't do anything else. Friends, the man couldn't go get baptized. The man couldn't go to a Bible study. The man couldn't even give anything left because he had nothing left to give. And I want you to see Jesus' incredible response. Verse 43, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in see it, that this man got filled with more than he could ever imagine, but he had to be emptied of everything he had first. And the one who empties himself will find God to be their all in all. And they'll receive eternal fill in paradise. Friends, hear this. None of us have kept the eighth commandment as we know it. All of us deserve to be one of those thieves up on the cross. Consider this. Have we ever stolen anything irrespective of its value? A piece of candy, a pen, a small amount of money, whatever it is. The Bible says thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. And neither will the greedy. Ever desire to have more and more and more and more even though you already had enough? Are we willing to give to others in order to help those without and to give up having something in order to help those without? If not, then friends, greed has a hold of us. All of us, pastor included, are guilty of breaking the Eighth Commandment. If we can respond like Judas and the other thief who remain hardened in their sin and try to justify themselves. Or we can be like the thief everyone remembers. Turn to Christ empty ourselves, place all of our hope in Him, and experience paradise, new life, and the forgiveness of sin. Friends, will we turn from our sin and ourselves and rest in the finished work of Christ? Will we by faith turn and receive an inheritance that is unfading, undefiled, and, 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 and kept in heaven for us? Because Jesus would invite us to not lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where love and rest destroy, where thieves can break in and steal, but to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven that aren't going anywhere. And to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
And all these things will be added unto us. Friends, today, if you, if things have a hold of you, you can be free. You can come and pray right where you are. You can come forward. You can respond however you need to to pray for, for, for those things to be taken off of you, for God to empty you so that you might be filled with more of Him. And God can save you today if you've never, if you don't have the confidence that this thief had, that you would be with Jesus in paradise. You can have that today. Not by simply showing up and checking a box. Not by giving more money. Not by all these ceremonial things that may be good on their own. But by putting trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone. He's the only one who can give us an unfading crown of glory. Let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, we recognize that you are the creator of all things. There's not a single thing we have that has not been given to each and every one of us. Rich, poor, somewhere in between. Everything we have is a gift from you. And a gift that you've given to us for the purpose of serving you, and loving you, and giving thanksgiving to you. So today I pray... That in this room, as we respond from, to your word, that you would break chains of greed that hold on to us. That you make us less greedy and more generous people. Lord, that we would ultimately realize we can never outgive the gift you already gave. You gave your son. That whosoever would turn to him by faith, I will perish for their sins, but have everlasting. May we place all of our hope, all of our faith, all of everything we have on Jesus Christ. We ask and we pray all these things.